I'm a non-residential uh, missionary. We travel in 30 and 32 countries right now, and our home base is Canada, and then our second home base is Ohio, and our third home base is Kyrgyzstan, so figure that one out. Anyway, I'm pleased to be here um, as part of the executive team for WWO, and to be co-leading this with uh, our, my dear colleagues. And um, so we're going to get started, because we won't want to take a lot of time just chit-chatting. And in this topic, what we're looking at is we're looking at a very sensitive sensitive topic. And it's one that I'll tell you most people are not very comfortable talking about. Do you find that with, with some of your colleagues? Talking about how to talk about sex, how to talk about the body and the anatomy of the body, as well as talking about how to keep yourself safe from child sexual abuse. So when we look at this, the discomfort that we have is really one that begins to put children off. Children know when you're uncomfortable. Do you agree with that? So if, if they think you're uncomfortable, they're not likely to talk with you about that subject. So what happens is that, and what we know, is that children are most likely to talk to those who really they trust the most. And it's often their friends. So, this, so they chat with their friends, and they talk with their friends, and they're not talking with us. We want them to talk with us. And the way we do that is we have to build a relationship with them. And we want to start to educate them about their anatomy right from the very beginning. We're always going to talk properly. And you know we're not going to use those little funny little words that are used sometimes, but we're going to speak properly. So by doing that, what happens is that we start to have a lot of good conversations and safe talk. Now, you have a handout I've given you, and it has some good information. I'm not going to ask you to read it here, but it's a handout that you can take and you can share with your colleagues. So it's, it's uh, good, solid information that comes from... Um, uh, solid uh, uh, tools in terms of looking at what we might be able to say to children, how do we involve children in talking about themselves and about their bodies, and then we've got some information on um, child sexual abuse as well. This is an 80-minute session group. We cannot cover a, everything or a lot, but hopefully what happens is that we can open the door, and by opening the door and giving you some tools here and having you think through some things, you can go home to your colleagues, your, your, uh, your workers, your staff, and share with them and begin to say, let's look at what we're doing. How can we do it a little stronger, a little better maybe? How can we do it more intentionally and maybe more often so that we're helping children to, to really protect themselves? We want to empower kids. Do you know kids are told that they shouldn't speak back to adults all the time? Don't you say no to me. When I say jump, you ask how high. I say go, you go. Isn't that what they're taught? So when we're teaching children, when from a very early age, they're taught the adult has the authority. The adult, the person in control, that person that has that power is the one that makes the rules. And as a child, you don't have a right to challenge those rules. Well, what we're going to do here today, we're going to teach children differently. We're going to empower them. We're going to empower them to create their boundaries, their, 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 their bubbles, and we're going to empower them to be able to speak boldly and loudly. And what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate that when we see that happening because we want children to be able to do whatever they can to try to really take ownership of their body and to really know that this is right or this is wrong. And we're not going to let somebody lie to them. We're not going to let somebody teach them to keep secrets. They can have a surprise, but never a secret. Make sense? We're going to walk through that a little bit. I am thrilled. That's a little bit about me and a little introduction where we're going. I'm going to introduce my colleague here, Remy. And Remy is going to actually just overview the program called Forgotten Voices. Have any of you heard of it? Forgotten Voices? Well, you're going to hear about it right now. So Remy's going to go over that, that particular program. What we're going to do, I'm going to come back and talk about Safe Talk and child sexual abuse, and then I'm going to show you the strategy that we use. We've been using all over the world. We've been using it for about 10 to uh, 12 years now, and uh, I've got great stories where kids have been safe as a result of it. Remy's then going to show you the uh, the project that they're using in terms of Safe a Touch, and called Touch Talk, and uh, again, another evidence-based one that is really getting good results, and then you're going to have some tools to take home. Does that make sense? Hannah's going to help us with that as well. All right, Remy, ready? Oh, yeah. 
This one's forward. That one's backwards. Oh, okay. So if you hit that one, you're in trouble. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh thank you so much. Um, again, my re my name is Remy Remy Hamapande. Um, I'm based in uh, Zambia, in Indola, near Congo, Congo uh, DR. So yeah, I um. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Ruby and Hannah, for coming in to help. The, the idea of um, teaching children to say no to sexual abuse, for me, it comes out of the, the fact that in most cases, we let it, you know, we start it late, so to speak. And in most cases, when we start it, it's all about don't do that. Don't do this. Don't. It's all the don'ts and don'ts and don'ts. And they, there wasn't a time when we were talking about things that they would feel good about. And I think this is the whole idea of this. But before I find myself deep into this, let me just introduce Forgotten Voices. Forgotten Voices uh, is a, a non-profit organization that uh, uh, tries to demonstrate the love of Christ by partnering with local churches in Southern Africa to empower families and caregivers to meet the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of orphans and vulnerable children in their communities. So that's our mouthful uh, mission statement. And the vision statement is that every child will experience the love of God and the security of a family, church, and community. So in our work, we, we try to recruit churches uh, on an annual basis, and then we continue renewing our memorandum of understanding with each other for a period of uh, five, five years uh, currently. And in... And, and we have churches that come, that we com, uh, you know, make, make that uh, memorandum of understanding with and become partners. We identify, the church has to identify five committed members of the church, volunteers or caregivers, that actually form up a committee to plan for their what we call custom plan. This, this is based on... Um, um, asset-based uh, development where they, they actually identify the challenges they are having in line with our, our mission statement and, and all what we desire that to happen. But the reason why we focus just on the church, for us the church is God's plan A and there's no plan B. And so we think that the church is well uh, vested and well uh, situated really in communities to handle that. And so they create that custom plan to address the local needs that they have in relation to orphans and vulnerable children. And then we empower them uh, through giving them grants. And these grants are there to help, uh, to help them, uh, families and caregivers, to basically get equipped with whatever they need. And, and in our help, there are all sorts of things that we do that I can't mention here. And so, after that, the, the, the orphans' needs, basically, then we hope they are met in a way. So the spiritual needs, the emotional need, and the physical needs are, are, are helped in that way. So the orphans and vulnerable children and the caregivers and, and, and the families as a unity is what we eventually target. But the conduit is the church, the local church. So uh, at that, we, we have these as the the three main pillars of our organization, the custom plan, empower, empowering the local church, and sustainability at the end. So, so this, this is it for now. Great. Thanks, Remy. Thank you very much. When we look at the children that we're working with, I want you to just begin to think about some of the kids that you are working with right now and some of their ages and some of the things that you're seeing. But um, uh, you think of one child in particular, and those of you who were in our session on trauma, we did this and we do this a little differently here. But um, how long have you worked with the child that you have in mind? Somebody got a child in mind? Give me an age. How many, oh, an age of a child you're thinking of? A nine-year-old. And how long have you worked with your nine-year-old? Nine years? Oh, from the very beginning. Is this your child, your birth child, or is it an adopted child? Or 
a child, a child that you're working with. Okay, great. Thank you. And someone else, a child that you're working with in age? An example of a child? 16-year-old? And how long have you worked with the, uh, the lady, the 16-year-old? Sorry, six years? Okay, great. Now, uh, the child that you're thinking about, the question that's next on the PowerPoint is kind of an interesting one. I want you to think about the, in the years that you've worked with this child, the number of conversations you might have had with this child about their body. Just think about that. We've got nine years and we've got you know, different, different numbers of years with the child you're thinking about. Okay. How many have had so many conversations you can't even think of, you know, can't even, you don't know? Anybody? No. How many? Yeah, you have maybe many, many conversations. You can't even count how many. And you, well, a couple people. Okay, okay. So it's a kind of an ongoing conversation then with that child as well. How many of you can say pretty honestly is that maybe a couple? Okay, got some nods. How many of you can say, well, we haven't had other people do that? Other people have that conversation. Okay, I have several of you there too. We're being real honest here and transparent. That's really common more so than you can even imagine. That we tend to be as adults pretty uncomfortable talking to kids about their bodies, the anatomy of their body and being really open about that. Many times we were not given good information when we grew up. Would you say that would be true? So we really learn from those who taught us. So the method in which we were shared information about our anatomy and how the anatomy works and what the body works and, and, uh, and what is the, 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 uh, the meaning with our body in terms of reproduction and, and um, even sexual abuse and sexual activity, we likely didn't have good models. I don't know how many of you learned in the bathroom from a friend. They just start talking about it. You know, we got girlfriends there and they're like, did you know? You, you, did, did you notice that she's now wearing a bra? She's getting breasts? You know, it's like, you know, so there's this like, there's this hush, husk kind of uh, attitude. Well, what we want to look about is that I ask you how many conversations you've had about a child and their anatomy, and I would say that probably this is probably even less than when it starts looking at child sexual abuse. Would you agree? Probably. So when we look at this, let's, let's, let's take the myths away a little bit. When we're talking about a child, about their body, what we're not talking about, we're not teaching sex. That's not sex teaching. What that is, is that's teaching anatomy. And we, and we need to know. So if we can even start looking at it as anatomy, it gets, it gets more likely we're going to talk about it. Make sense? So we're talking about anatomy. It's teaching anatomy. When we teach children about child sexual abuse a little bit different here, we are not teaching about sex, but we're teaching about safety. Now, so let's go back. So instead, when we're looking at, we're not teaching sex when we're talking about their body. We're teaching anatomy. And then, when we're teaching about child sexual abuse, we're not teaching about sex, we're teaching about safety. And so that's a real different uh, kind of a perspective for us. But if we can start talking that way to ourselves and thinking that way, it frees us up a bit to be more open with our children. Now, when we look at by the age of four, what should be happening? We should be, by the age of four, kids should know their bodies. They should know their bodies. They should be able to, to, uh, to uh, um, understand a few things about their bodies and, and their anatomy and how the anatomy works. I want them to um, understand uh, words that are, uh, that are clear. So we want to eliminate those weird names. Your TT, your doo doo, your Wawa. I mean, I mean, have you heard them? They're ridiculous. And so can you imagine in a professional world, a child is 12 years old, the child has been sexually abused, has never gotten language that is able to explain their anatomy, and in this situation, this has become a child protection issue, and the child protection social worker, I'm a licensed social worker, I've heard these things, the child protection social worker is talking to the child, what has happened to you, and the child says, well, um, he, he looked at my woo-woo and wanted the wee-wee. You, what? You, honestly, group, as ridiculous as that sounds, that's what we hear. That is what we hear. And when you look at then being uphold to be able to say this is a child sexual abuse issue, you cannot back it up when you don't have the correct words. 
You can't. A court of law won't listen to it. And as, as, an, as an American and a Canadian in both countries and working in both in child sexual abuse, let me tell you, I've seen many of the cases thrown out because the judge says, sorry, we just don't have evidence. We can't talk about things. We, we don't have evidence. There's not clear indication that's what the child meant. And it doesn't go any further. So we want to eliminate those crazy, crazy words. We want to recognize and help children to understand that their genitals are private parts of their body. And what are the genitals? And, and to be really clear what those are. We want to make children ch sure that children uh, want to do what they need to do uh, if something is wrong. Where do they go? Who do they talk to? They need that information desperately. We want to build trust with them because remember, they're only going to talk to the person that they trust most. So we want to build trust and we want to have talking points for discussion. We might have talking times. I know a family in particular that they would have talking points on Saturday mornings after they did their chores around the house, and they would have, okay, what are the real important things right now that's been on your mind this week? And they did that for their kids from very young right on to older, and they talked about all kinds of things. And the talking points that they had, that they created as part of the culture of their family, really kept things open to talk about these really hard topics. We want to increase the potential for health and safety for our children. And by doing that is we are teaching them their anatomy. They need to know what their genitals are. And in doing that, they need to call a penis a penis. There's nothing wrong with it. I guess it's what it is. So when we look at that, we want them to know what their scrotum is. They want to be able to speak that word. We want them to be able to speak of the vagina and know what the vagina is for a girl, what the penis is for a boy. Girls need to know boys' anatomy. Boys need to know girls' anatomy. They also want to make sure that they understand what the buttocks is, what the anus is as well, because they want to know. Absolutely. And you need to find the words in the local language. What is the local language using that is recognized by everyone? And I have found what, what happens is that we do have solid words that are maybe not necessarily a national word, but it's a word that is a local, local word that is clearly understood by everybody. Do you have them in, in your country? The English in the English word, and, and really, we're looking at what is the word that is being used in the culture as close to the real word and away from slang. If there are different slang words used, it's going to really be confusing for kids and confusing in terms of being able to support any kind of, 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 of legal, legal touch, yeah, back. So part of even what we can do in terms of really influencing our, our safety for kids is beginning to start to formulate that standardized way that we're speaking with kids. So that kids are learning this and then we know exactly what this means. When we look at this, our goal is, and our goal is a pretty simple goal is we want to teach children that their body belongs to them. It's not okay for anyone to look at it, to touch it, or to have anything to do with it, nor to, to do the same with theirs in showing them, etc. So we want to be involved in the child's life because clearly if we're not involved in the child's life, the child's not going to talk to us. We've already kind of established that. And in part of that is we want to stay connected to the child, build that relationship, make sure you build that trust with them, meet their needs. Let the people know... Um, that, uh, that little people know that you're there for them. I want to know who the people are in my child's life. Who are they playing with? Who are the parents? Who are the coaches? So the, one of the ways of keeping kids safe is knowing who are the adults that are in their life. We know, and you know, that perpetrators are drawn to where children are playing and where they're working, and they're, they're drawn in in terms of activities where they can be with children, right? So it's real scary because, I mean, coaches, child care workers, teachers, Sunday school teachers. I mean, it goes on and on. Perpetrators are, that are perpetrating against children are drawn to where children are. Playground supervisors in, in the U.S. we see crosswalk people that help kids get across dangerous highways. I mean, they come in every, and all over, but we want to know who are the people, the adults in the child's life. We want to also, in our programs, and we're going to talk about child protection policies, and Hannah, you may want to talk about this a little further, and she's doing a session later on it. 
I encourage you to get in there. But child protection policies, and part of that is, is looking, how do we choose our caregivers? How do we choose our workers to make sure that we have safe people working with our children? Because we have responsibility there. In addition to that, we want to know the, and share the dangers of media, how media draws kids in, especially our older kids, into ch uh, child sexual abuse, to trafficking, et cetera. So we want to be aware of that and put new media protections in place for our kids to keep our kids safe and help them to know the warning signs as well as we know the warning signs. There is good touch and there is bad touch. We all know that, right? We've all heard that a hundred times. So if we look at the three touches that we have, we have safe touch. What's a safe touch? Give me an example. A pat on the shoulder, might, might be a high five, yeah, good ones, good ones. Is a hug a safe touch? Could be. What's the relationship? Exactly. Is there permission to hug? What is the hug? And looking at, in terms of safe touch, unsafe touch, and unwanted touch. So an unwanted touch might be the child doesn't want hugged, right? Doesn't feel comfortable. They may have had some situations where people have uh, used and put in unsafe touch, where the touch is getting into uh, their um, uh, their their uh, their body in in a way that that's uncomfortable for them. Is touching into into their genitals, or is touching them in such a way that confuses them an unwanted touch. So when we look at this, we want to teach kids and we want to maybe make, depending on the age of the child, make some charts and, and talk about that and what that might mean so a child can really sort that out as well. We need to teach kids some really primary rules or, or primary guidelines. Number one, in our safe talk with kids, I want to have conversations with my children that give them a clear message that for someone, uh, that it's not okay for someone to touch their body parts. Not okay. We have no, no one can do that, and let them know it's not okay. And in addition to that, who's allowed to touch a private part? What's that? Only the child. But then as well, we, we have little children who are being bathed and being cared for by mommy and daddy or auntie and uncle or grandma. And, and there's, there's some cultural uh, practices that are there that are all part and parcel to hygiene and cleanliness. And so it's helping kids to kind of know the difference and to know when there's something uncomfortable or really into those unwanted touches and what that might be as well. We also want them to know very clearly that it's really not OK to touch someone else's body parts. So we don't touch their genitals either, either. And that we're, we're uh, recognizing that some of the touching that maybe happened to us is really unwanted, uncomfortable touch for others. And very much is that it's not touch that we um, accept when someone asks us to touch their body and to touch their genitals or to get into some of that uncomfortable touch. It's not OK for someone to touch his or her own body part in front of you to be touching caressing, playing, or asking you to do the same, to ask you to touch their body part into, or to your own body part as well. It's not okay for someone to ask you to take your clothes off in front of them, to show you videos of people with their clothes off, or photos with people with their clothes off, or to ask you to bring pictures and find pictures or take pictures, et cetera, with their clothes off. It is not OK for someone to show you photos or videos of people without their clothes on. I already gave you that one. And then finally, it's no, oh, oh, this is going to go back through again. Yeah, that's a craziness. OK, so we want to be involved in the child's life, because children are not going to actually even tell you that's happening if they don't feel like you are able to listen to it. Children, if they think you're afraid to hear that information, they won't talk to you. Make sense? Makes sense. OK, so we want to show interest in their daily lives, join a relationship with them, get to know them, spend time with them, and recognizing that kids that are coming to us from a hard place, kids that are foster kids, kids that are coming into our, our, our residential programs, they don't believe that we are probably, they probably don't believe we're safe people. Do you think that's true? If they don't feel we're safe people, you know what? We're not safe people. So the only way we're going to get there is show interest in them. We have to be able to build that trust with them by being in their life, being present with them, and pouring into them. Yes? Do you know what I was thinking? This is critical, and a big gap, I think, in child safeguarding is we underestimate 
this being involved because the reality is that someone wants to uh, sexually abuse a child goes will groom the child so if we're not if there's not safe people showing an interest some the unsafe person will and i think that if there's no one that the child can go to they'll just start trusting this other person i think grooming is such a critical part of this isn't it and so, this is so key and i think that's what yeah, and Ken is absolutely right. And keeping in mind, children who are trafficked, that are trafficked out, the most vulnerable for those to be trafficked are children who are coming out of their orphanages because they've really not experienced the safe touch. They've not experienced the education, the training, the, the equipping that they need to be able to discern what is going on. And often, I have found in orphanages, one of the things that's happened that's really put kids vulnerable is that orphanage directors have told kids, go and hug the strangers. There are donors. Mm -hmm. Love on them. Hey, be really nice there. I've had kids come sit on my lap. And I'm thinking, I am here to do, you know, basically this. I'm not here to have kids hanging on me. And uh, you have taught this child to come and jump on my lap. Let me, they want to pick me to pick them up. I thought, this is dangerous. And our kids that come out of those systems where that has happened, they are vulnerable because they're, they're, they're craving that and they're, they've found that that gets a return for them. So the likelihood of a trafficker coming in and saying, hey, you're just the cutest little thing I've ever seen. You know, I got a really good job for you. It's just that they buy in. They're vulnerable. They're vulnerable. And we, we make them vulnerable. So we want them to get to know us. We want them to understand their body. We want them to be safe. And we also want to recognize that a perpetrator is an expert groomer and getting them ready. And uh, there was a wonderful study by Anna Salter that, um, uh, a number of years ago. And what she did is she went into prisons of, um, and interviewed perpetrators. And she got a huge amount of information. And one of the things she began to see is to see the grooming cycle that they had and looking at the faults, um, the, the errors, the er uh, thinking errors that they had that pulled them into the psyche, uh, that cycle and how one would lead to the next error, the next error that the, of their thinking and we could call it error, we could call it, um, um, uh, there would be another word for it, I'm not thinking of, of thinking, but with their errors and their thinking. But one would lead to another one, it would get more involved until before long they groomed this child and this child was put in a position for uh, some extreme sexual abuse. So looking at as well, um, we want to make sure that we choose our caregivers carefully, I've said this before, Talk about the media, I said this before, and I just want to recap it again and just to make sure we're really seeing the importance of it, and then also to know the warning signs, and I mentioned it before. Teach your child about their boundaries, their bubble. And really, this is where we get a lot of our kids who are vulnerable, don't have boundaries. They, they have such a craving and a seeking to be connected, and they don't even understand what it means. They, it's just an internal seeking, the desire to be connected. And what ends up happening is that they don't understand that I have boundaries, and other people have boundaries, and that they have a right to boundaries as well. Yes. No, lady? Um, this is really an important comment, and I, this is where an 80-minute session is really no long, not, not at all long enough to really deal with this, but let me quickly do. And I encourage you to go to the one on child protection policies. Your programs, our programs all need child protection policies. How do we bring people in? How do we, invest, how do we assure that we've done the, the safety checks, the, the police checks, or whatever's available in your country, the reference checks, et cetera? How do we monitor? What are our guidelines that children can be alone or not alone with someone? What are those guidelines, and uh, where can adults go and not go, and, and, and related to a child's space, et cetera. Those are all part and parcel of a child protection policy. And let, if we don't have one, we are really vulnerable. We are really vulnerable. And I think we're also being absolutely, ridiculously negligent if we don't have a child protection policy. So really looking at that and making sure that you've got that and that's really clear. 
in our child protection policy, if a person has ever even been accused of child abuse, neglect, and heaven forbid, sexual abuse, they absolutely will never be involved in any child program for us. Never. I don't care if they have repented and they're the pastor of the church because it is not going to happen. And that's our child protection policy. And I mean, everybody's a little bit different. Yes? Yes. I would actually have to show my criminal record if I apply for a job. Uh, I know that it's not the case in every country, but in our country it's not. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate it. What's your name? I want to call you by name. What is your name? Mika. Mika? Okay. MIK. Um, perfect. Absolutely. This is an important comment, so we need to know the laws of our land, know what it is in our country and, and what we can and can't do. But even beside that, it doesn't mean, if the, if the law doesn't eliminate that potential, as such as in Finland, we still should have our child protection policies. And I will absolutely be firm in saying to you, and I would back this up no matter who wants to argue with it, I would err on the side of safety. I would always err on the side of safety. If the policy, if, if there's even a little doubt that, well, that might be a little strict, I'm sorry, I'm erring on the side of safety with the policy. That's personal, and our, the way our organization works, yes? Just to say, too, just to back that up totally, and anybody that would say, but I can't get that, that, that just raised a red flag for me. Absolutely. Anybody can get that background check, mm -hmm. anybody can do that, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant, actually. And I think really we need to hear what you have to say and just really listen to what she said. Any one of you that are really involved in this and, and you've had some of these experiences, well, you know, my goodness, the devastation to a child if we're not doing due diligence and looking as well. Hannah, you have a comment? Just a very quick one. To in just to encourage con people from countries where... You know, you think, oh, I can't get a police check. There's not the systems, you know, and th there's no records anyway, so what's the point? I think we found in our organization in Zambia that just to be very clear in your policy and state it can act as a deterrent. So even though it might be a totally flawed system, the fact that you're saying to people, this is what we expect, you can deter people. And yeah, so I think just do it anyway. Um, yeah. That's really, it's really good. I mean, it's like you don't want to put the fear into everybody, but the same hand, yes, you do want to put the fear into everybody. We're not going to tolerate this. We're not there. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Zero tolerance, absolutely. Uh, we need to let kids know that they won't be in trouble for telling us what's going on. And at the same time, we need to um, give them chances to, um, to raise the topic and talk about it. And if they're not going to do that, we need to have those talking points, again, that we looked at before. So we're looking at what is child sexual abuse. I think uh, some of us have really gone through some training on that. I want to just really quickly tell you you've got some good handouts to start with means you still have research you can do and learning you can do. But child sexual abuse is any form of abuse that includes sexual activity with a minor. And a child cannot consent to any form of sexual abuse. And a child is a child is a child. So if you've got a teenager that's 15, 16 years old, and someone says, well, they've been seductive, they, they, uh, they ask for this. I am sorry, a 15, 16 year old cannot ask to be sexually, and have sexual intercourse and know that they're asking for sexual activity. That is sexually stylized behavior. It's behavior that may be learned to maybe get favor. There may be some other needs that are being met with that. But there are clearly, clearly people who think that a, a, a boy-man sex, that the boy is asking for sex. And the boy is not asking for sex. I am sorry. It is, or no, I'm not sorry. It is not any form of sexual request from a child. I have a, had a foster girl that was 17 years old, and uh, she was uh, uh, found a boyfriend. 
And uh, we'd had all kinds of talks about different things, and she had been a foster child for two years. And uh, she had a date. This was her first date. She was 17 years old, and she was going to a movie. It was a late afternoon movie she was going to with her boyfriend. And um, we're really excited because it's her first boyfriend, and first time we've really kind of led her to do this. And so she's going out with this boy. And uh, I'm in the kitchen, and she comes back. The boy comes into the house, walks her into the house, and it's, it's just not a little late afternoon. It's not quite dark. It's just getting dusky. And uh, they come in, and I can see them when they come into the house. Uh, I wasn't spying, honestly. I truly wasn't. But um, anyway, they come in, and um, uh, I happen to notice, hmm, he put his arms around her. And then... He was going to give her a little kiss. I could see what was happening. I think, gee whiz, that was pretty quick. And here's what she does. She puts her arms up around him, and she does this little thing. Her foot goes way up in the air. Way up in the air. I can't do it. But way up in the air. You know what I mean? Have you ever seen that happen? Where do you see it? In the movies. Exactly. I'm looking at this. I'm thinking, Sherry, what is all that about? And it's just a little peck. That's all it was. And it was just, it was just you know, silly kind of fun. So anyway, I thought, oh, gosh, I want to talk with her about that. So I did. I called her in. I said, Sherry, I said, you know, when James left, I said, I wasn't really spying on these, but I noticed that he gave you a little, little kiss and that you threw your foot way up in the air. I said, why did you do that? I said, I've just never seen, seen that done before. And she said, oh, Mom. She says, that's the way it's done in the movies. You see? What is that sexually stylized behavior or romance stylized behavior? Call it whatever you want. But kids model this. Uh, watch their Facebook poses right now. Watch the Facebook poses of young girls right now. There are sexually stylized poses. Where are they getting it? It's what everybody's doing right now. Are they asking some person to look at their profile and call them up for sex? No. They're trying to be cute. It's a sexually stylized, modeled after other behaviors. So what we, by stepping into the child's story and being there and helping them to understand the media issues, the risks that are there, the, the sexually stylized uh, ways uh, that the media is pushing clothing at kids, etc., we're helping them to make better decisions and helping to understand. Child sexual abuse does not, include, does not need to include physical contact to be sexual abuse. Does that surprise you? The way you talk to a child could be sexual abuse. When you talk to a child. So sexual abuse, yes? Just a really interesting point around, um, just a really interesting point about you saying about stylized sexual, I think in Zambia, we've had a few times in our trainings, boys, that, that sort of assumption that it's not sexual abuse if it's a boy, because it's like they're they're gonna they're learning to be a man. If you're if they're a man, then this is a good thing that a woman is wanting. Or um, so it's almost the opposite. Like they're thinking, well, this is this is this isn't abuse. Because men that we've worked with, they said, well, I never knew that I was sexually abused. I thought it was just me being a. a that's true, hey, yeah, Remy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it for for a boy. It, it's almost like they're naturally that way, and they say, "Yeah, yeah, it's exactly." And so, they, they, it's basically missing it. It's almost like it's it's dropping through the cracks, and they can't see that this is abuse. And and part of it also, you know, it's more and more girls, or you know, under the age of even thirteen or fourteen begin some even begin to have families and so there's this confusion of even people when they talk about it they don't even know when do we start you know Good point. Uh, we had a foster child, a little girl that came to us, been sexually abused by her father, her birth father, for years. They were a family from Mexico living in the United States. And uh, uh, she didn't tell anybody about her sexual abuse until one day she saw her younger sister being walked into the same room where her father had always sexually abused her. And she absolutely could not um, accept what was going on, and she completely lost uh, her composure went uh, completely screaming to a neighbor. Anyway, it, it drew the attention to it, and as a result, the children were removed and put to safety. And father ended up going to prison. But in the process of this, and part of the reason the father ended up in prison, is that he essentially told the judge and told the legal authorities that this was okay, because in Mexico, this is what we do. We, we get our girls ready. Now, it's not true. They don't all do that. But there was, there was some element within his, maybe his circle, that let that to be, uh, and, and that's the way it went, and ended up, in, you know, as, as his belief that he was just getting those girls ready, yes. Uh, in Thailand, and some of the Hilti, um, communities, 
Mm -hmm. There is an issue with um, uh, women that uh, masturbate their babies mm -hmm. when they to sleep. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really tough one culturally. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, that to me is yeah. abuse, you know. Yeah. Um, but this is something that they do in private. Or, you, know, it's, it's, you see it less now, but you know, 15, yeah. 20 years ago, walking through the market, the lady mm -hmm. selling new vegetables would be sitting with her hands inside her child's mm -hmm. diaper. Mm -hmm. And that to them was not about stimulation. It was this good feeling that put the child to sleep. Right. Yeah, it's it's not only happens here. There are other other uh, countries we've worked in where I've heard that practice as well as well, and uh, recognizing uh, there are uh, many different practices. That as we look at this, we have to ask ourselves what is the ultimate outcome. And when we're really starting to look at it from our perspective, we're looking at it through our own cultural lens. I mean, we, we already know that, but we also have to look at it a cultural lens as what is best practice say? What does the research say? That's really even bigger than what we are in terms of what is healthy behavior and healthy teaching for children and sometimes it just isn't going to be um, a, what what the culture is doing and so we really have to be really aware of that and be sensitive to it as well and I think that's what you were sharing even even looking at what is the the, the anatomy, anatomy of a child and what's called uh, looking at child sexual abuse I'm going to do this and then Remy I'm going to turn over to you because I want you to have time to do um, touch talk and then I'll come back to saying no is that okay Okay, so what we're looking at is we're looking at uh, child sexual abuse and what it includes. Uh, exhibition, uh, exhibitionism, I, my, my tongue is getting tired of talking. Uh, and looking at as well, exposing oneself to a minor, looking at fondling a child, looking at intercourse, of course. I, I don't have it on the continuum, but I could have put it. There is a continuum we could look at from here to here, looking at uh, where there's no touching and there's, there's um, uh, there, there could be pictures, there could be talk, etc. So I could have done it on continuum, but these are just some of the things that include masturbation in the presence of a minor or forcing a minor to masturbate. Um, Obscene phone calls, text messages, or digital uh, kinds of interactions through other, other uh, social media, etc. Producing, owning, or sharing pornographic images or movies of children. We had a county school psychologist that, as I was the director of the Child Protection Agency at the time in the state of Ohio, and uh, uh, there was a county school psychologist that we had hired. We were all so proud of him and so excited because he was so amazing and wonderful. Um, he fostered um, uh, respite care. Some of the boys that were in one of our residential homes in Ohio, um, I had one of the boys come back and said, uh, Ruby, he said, I, I don't want to go there anymore. Anymore. Why? And he said, well, he says, because, and this is a bedwetting child, and he says, because he tried to put something, and we went camping, and they went camping, and he said, we went camping, and he said, he tried to put a hose on my penis so that uh, I could pee into the hose, because at night, because I, I, you know, he wets. And he says, that's really weird. I said, yeah, it is really weird. Well, we like this county psychologist so well, we overlooked that. We thought, He's just weird. You know, he's a psychologist and crazy. Later we found out he was doing assessments on kids and he was keeping a database of kids and that in that database, the assessment he did that he had approved by the state of Ohio to use about the kid's sexuality and some questions, he had a second one he kept in his drawer to find his victims. And in the process of this grooming that went on and finding his victims as well, once it became known and uh, some kids came forward and it just began to be really well known that he had been sexually abusing these boys, um, a lot of it through camping experiences, that what he had, he had an absolute unbelievable amount of videos and child pornography in his home. Just about every room they went into, there was child pornography in the room. But you begin to look at is that uh, the, uh, the, the, the person you're looking at is not always the person you're looking at and what you think. We're looking at child sexual abuse, any kind of uh, um, um, sex that, that's with a minor that includes vaginal, oral, or anal sex. Um, so we're looking at uh, any kind of an act that has uh, sexual content to it, um, sexual penetration, sexual touching, and any kind of a sex act that uh, with, with a minor. And then we're also looking at sex trafficking. We're looking at, as well, any other sexual conduct that is harmful to the child's mental, emotional, or physical welfare. Now, I already told you, know your laws. What does a perpetrator look like, group? It looks like you and me, absolutely. Every, every um, profession has had perpetrators, people that we respect and admire. They don't look like this dirty old guy that's in the back of a corner or dirty old women. Sexual perpetrators are both men and women. 
period. Um, women perpetrate on boys. Women perpetrate on girls. Men perpetrate on boys. Men perpetrate on girls. Kids in control that have authority and power or as a babysitter. They have power over someone. It's a perpetrator. If they're, if, they're, if they're perping on them. So when we look at this, perpetrators is usually someone the child knows and knows well. Someone who's gained the trust of the child. They're not necessarily an adult, and that surprises people sometimes. A babysitter who has control over a child can be a perpetrator. They have power over the child. They could be a sibling. They could be part of the family. They could be a friend, a coach. They could be a pastor, a neighbor. They could be a teacher, um, be a playmate, or where there's power involved. So... I'm not going to spend a lot of time on child protection policies. I've talked about that. I do encourage you to go to the next session that is on child protection policies. It would be a good one to really look at and how you... Yes. It's what time? Tomorrow at oh, tomorrow. It's not today. It's tomorrow at 2 p.m. Yes. Okay, so something to keep on your, on your radar. All right, what I want to do, group, um, I have a practice that I use, and I have a video to go with it. I want to show you that eventually, but I want to get to Touch Talk. Um, we didn't know Remy was going to be here. Originally, we were planned to have Remy, and then Remy couldn't be here. But now that he's here, and I found out last night, so we're, we're going to move things around so we can get Touch Talk in here, and then hopefully I'll have enough time to do the uh, how to say no and show the video as well. So... Bear with us. We're going to switch around, and Remy, I'm going to get your PowerPoints up. Are you okay with that? Yeah, sure. Um, Hannah will, will actually run us through this. You have a few on the tables. I think they're just two. Um, Hannah is with a, uh, a ministry called Tehila, um, and they train. We collaborate with them, collaboration. And so they train our pastors and church leaders uh, in, in child protection and or safe places. So she, she came at the right time to actually do this because she's the expert. <laughs> um, I was going to say, is it morning or? Sunday. Are we afternoon? Afternoon, yeah. So my name's Hannah. Um, I'm British, but I live in Zambia, been in Zambia for eight years. Um, so we run, an, me and my husband and a Zambian friend, colleague, good friend of Remy's, Martin Kapenda, we run Tahila. Uh, but very briefly, uh, how long have I got? 10 minutes? Ten minutes. We're okay. So um, I think uh, I'm a social worker by trade. I've been a social worker a long time, working in child safeguarding for many years, too many years. I know I look about twenty, but I'm not. Um, so yeah. So we, our passion is that if you want to safeguard children, you need to train adults around the child. But ultimately, you also have to train children. You have to equip children, make sure they know how to protect themselves, how to minimize the risk. Child abuse is never a child's fault. However, they can learn protective behaviors to minimize that risk and also to minimize risks to their peers. Children speak to other peers, speak to their ch other children. Often a trusted, ch a trusted friend of a child is another child. So if they know about how to keep themselves safe, then it's a good, it's a good move. So we, um, this program, Touch Talk, was originally developed in Cambodia. Um, a colleague, Glenn Miles, was supposed to be here at this, uh, at this event, but he couldn't make it. Um, but, but this was originally created in Cambodia. I'd seen this online, and in the spirit of collaboration, we were thinking, there's no point in recreating something. Let's contact Glenn. I loved what I saw. Let's see if we can model it in Africa and do an African version. So we contacted him. He said yes. And uh, yeah, so we developed. We bought some puppets. You see these puppets on the front. And we did. Uh, we worked with an organization called Moana Ministries, which is a media, uh, tea for Christian media company in Zambia. And we put together this this program. And we never knew how impactful this would be. It's just been incredible. Um, just very briefly, we don't allow this to be run in any environment that doesn't already have a child protection policy. The reason being is that this program encourages children to speak out, and they do speak out, just I think because of the nature of the program. I'll explain in a little bit why. But children, disclosures are made quite regularly with our, the way we use this program. If the, if the adults around their child don't know what to do with a disclosure, you know, children, it takes a, a lot of... If a child speaks out about abuse, you know, that's a big deal. You don't want to then say, send them away and don't do anything. So, you know, that might be the only time that they speak out. So 
the people around them need to know how to respond to abuse. So we would encourage anyone to use this to firstly have a child protection policy, not just a policy. A policy is a piece of paper at the end of the day. They need to have a, a, a fully a culture of safeguarding in their church or organization in order to run this. So that would be my first thing. But basically, um, I think the reason it's effective is it's because uh, it's the third person. So we're talking about issues of sexual abuse from the puppet point of view. And I think the for you know, sometimes if we're going through something painful, sometimes it's, it's, it's sort of helpful to say, oh, it's my friend that's going through that, rather than ourself. And I think that's why children relate to it, because the, the puppets in the program are going through the, their things they're going through, but rather than having to put their hand up and say, that's me, they can do it through the puppet. Does that make sense? So I think that's why it's quite effective. So it's a story, it's like a flip book. So it sits on the, on the table. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a story of three children. Um, we've got it on here, but I won't, I'll just briefly. So it's a story um, of three, three children. And on the back, you'll see, this is for the facilitator. It's very, you can train people to use this. It's so easy. Um, and the facilitator reads the story and then they just hold some discussion and, um, and yeah, and there's some general answers on the back. And it goes through the story of three children, gift, precious, and mercy. Um, and, uh, and, and just to acknowledge what um, um, Ruby's been talking about, I think the main thing that we're capturing in this is, uh, is that stage almost before the sexual abuse takes place. If you imagine sexual abuse is, is a continuum, yeah? And the grooming is what we're wanting to, to break into. Because once the, you know, rarely does some abuser just go and start the abuse. It's a process. It's a process of grooming. And I think the, the grooming process is fascinating in a, in a, I'm not meaning that in a positive way, but how people groom children you know, it, we sometimes think that sexual abuse is a very violent, a, a violent thing, but often abuse happens in a, in a way that by the time the child is touched, they've got to a point where the child is almost going along with the, the experience. And it's a very confusing experience for children to be sexually abused because you're playing around with a child's genitals that bring pleasure and they're doing it with someone that says they love them and they're, they're trusting that person and they, they're quite young and no one's ever told them that it's wrong and yet it is wrong and it feels also uncomfortable. So it's a very confusing experience for a child and what, what we're trying to do through Touch Talk is break that grooming and getting children to identify from a young age, not just to say no, but to recognise you know, and I guess that's how I'm building their resilience, like what you said about build, building strong, it's so important to connect with our children so that we have a relationship with them. So this is all a process of grooming and it goes through these three children that go to school and they are at school, it's quite a simple process, but at school they learn these four key messages. The first message is, I am special. So we talk about what is it to be special. We try and build their confidence. What is it to be special? What is special in front of oh, It's a Christian program. Like, who am I? What does God think about me? We explore this. And it can take ages or it can take a short time, depending on the group that you're with. We talk about safety. What does it mean to feel safe? And it's talk about feeling safe, like you said. Just because my mum tells me I'm safe, just because this man who touches me says I'm safe and just be with me, and if, if, you, if you tell anyone, then your mum's going to die. Or, uh, you know, what, but do I feel safe? Yeah? So we talk about feeling safe. We then talk about my body belongs to me. Very simple message. Often these children have never heard that concept. I didn't know my, my body was mine. Yeah? So my body belongs to me, and I can get help. So we explore these uh, in the context of a story. We talk about good touch, bad touch. In certain environments around the world, in Zambia where we run this, uh, children find this very difficult. In fact, they don't say it from it. We have to get them to come to the front. So they sort of scurry to the front and then they'll go like that. They, don't, they find it uncomfortable to share where good touch is and bad touch. So we talk about this um, um, from their point of view. Uh, really helpful around the phrases. It's something, the anatomy, very difficult to talk about that in Zambia. Then we talk about um, this man, Mr. Banda, which is a bit awkward because it's the most common name in Zambia. So, <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Bander, there's normally a Mr. Bander in the room when we're trained. So we sort of say, look, I'm sorry we've called it Mr. Bander, you're not an abuser. But Mr. Bander's here, and we talk about this relationship that starts to grow with Mr. Bander, yeah? Um, and how he gets to know the children. This is obviously, this, is, this abuse situation is out of the family, but we will we address like internal uh, familial abuse as well. But we talk, we talk a lot about this person. What is she feeling? You know, this one, this one's getting the attention from Mr. Banda, but how is this one feeling? We often ignore the child that's watching on. And so, yeah, we just explore the emotions around what they might be feeling. He meets with her. We talk about the environment, where they're meeting. That we, this explore, starts to explore conversations around the map of where children live. How do they get home, you know? We worked with a 14, I was in court with a 14 year old about two years ago. She was, she was walking back from her school via the market. She was with a friend at the market. At the market, she decided to leave her friend, buy the vegetables for mum and walk the shortcut back home. It was the rainy season in Zambia. In the rainy season in Zambia, the grass suddenly grows like from nowhere. As she walked down that shortcut, she got raped uh, by two men. Now the question is, that wasn't her fault. Yeah, but could she have put, could she have made a different decision that could have prevented that happening? Does that make sense? Could we have avoided that? If someone had talked to her about how do you walk home from school, something very simple, yeah, could that have been avoided? So we, we talk a lot about this environment, which is quite a sort of uh, familiar look in Zambia. Then we talk about touch, again, like, do you feel comfortable with cuddles? And uh, we talk about secrets. This girl behind here is being abused. These two are talking. Who does she speak to? We talk uh, on the next page. We oh, then we talk about the actual defilement here. But we do it in an age-appropriate way. Yeah, this is this book can be from age seven. We've done it with five, six, seven years, but because you can adapt it for the age. In Zambia, in England, like if I worked with some kids in England, they'd, they'd like, what the F is that? They wouldn't like this book. But 17-year-olds in, in Zambia love this concept, so it really works on what, who you're working with. And then we also talk about boy abuse. We talk about gift, gift thinking. If this can happen to them, could it happen to me? We talk about boys that could be going through abuse. Yeah, so we follow this story. They remember their messages. There's a helpline in, in Zambia that we partnered with to do this, 116. There's questions of how effective helplines are. Um, but yeah, we have that. And then they talk to their teacher and get some help. We, we identify, yeah, so they try and identify six trusted people that they could get help from. Um, but as I said, this program really has to be done in an environment where the adults would do something about it. Because in you know, a lot of our times we're running this program, children are speaking out about something they're going through. Um, so, yeah, so I don't know if anyone has any brief questions about Touch Talk before I hand over to... Um, I'm sorry, I feel like I've rushed through that. I was conscious of time. Yes. It's a really good question. You mean, do children lie about abuse? I think research would suggest that children don't lie about abuse. I think they can exaggerate the truth or distort some facts. But children, and very clever about the language. I've been recently working with a five-year-old who the systems in Zambia are really struggling to believe her. And even when we took her to the police officer, the officer even sort of laughed a little bit. Like, are you, who's going to take this child seriously, you know? But, but if you really interview that child, the language they're using, they just wouldn't have come up. They talk about daddy, daddy weed grey. Now, daddy's, we don't weed grey, do we? we don't, that's, he, she's talking about sperm and semen. She's not talking about urine. Uh, so I think, where would she have got that from? If, you know, if we really listen to the child, she talks about how daddy said that if, if she tells anyone that she's going to she's going to find her mum under the ground with all her bones out of her body. I mean, where does that come from? Like, so I think that my view is it's better to veer on the side of let's, let's believe our children and prove innocence rather than just thinking our oh, children haven't got any voice, I can't be listened to. But I do think it's complicated. I think that there are times that maybe some of the older children might might 
create something, but I think generally, I wouldn't, I don't know from my other experts, a research would suggest that no, children may distort truth, but they rarely lie um, about abuse. Yeah, particularly sexual abuse and other forms of violence. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, she's got another one. <laughs> If you've abused them. So the question is, if you abused your child, would the child love you more? If you abused the child. Do you know what? From my experience as a social worker, children love their parents. Yeah, They might sometimes be scared of them, and they might sometimes stir uncomfortable feelings when they're with them, depending on how that adult... But from my experience, a child will always love. It's a very complex relationship, I think. Is it, would you agree? Abuse is, abuse is, is not as clear cut as we think. Like it, it involves a, a lot of, in, most forms of abuse have a deep emotional, it's about power. So I think that, you know, if you even think of physical abuse, it's often the emotional abuse, or if you th even ourselves, if we think about our own childhood, it's often the, the emotional things that were said to us, or not the physical harm, or the... And I think parents, people that want to abuse children, they can really deceive and manipulate and, and control, and so the relationship that children have with their abusers can be very complicated, um, and very... And so it's very, we have to be very careful with children if, if they've been abused. To say to a child, oh, that your father, he's so bad. He, we have to be very sensitive on how, when we're working with children because their relationship with their parents can be very complex. And we don't want to put words into their mouth and make them hate their parents. But So in answer to your question, I'm, I think it depends on the individual child. If you abused your child, they might hate you. But from my work with children... They, lo they, they crave to get your attention and crave. I've been in situations with where the worst abuse has happened to a child and I've sat in a room and all that child wants is craving their parent to just give them something, yet they've been hideously abused. And you think, how do you even want to have the attention of your parent? But, but, it's a but at the end of the day, that, that, that's their parent and whatever love they got, that's all they knew. And I don't know, would you agree? that? Yeah. Yeah, shame. Yeah. And let me just share with you is that kids, um, kids can tend to refute. So what will happen is that um, they seldom lie. The research is very clear that when a child is expressing that they've been abused, they're seldom lying, and that they often refute. So it's not uncommon. So that's why people think, well, you've lied, because now you're saying it didn't really happen. Well, refuting is pretty common as well. As well. We have about, fi about 10 minutes, and uh, we have two things that we want to do. I want to give you a strategy that you can actually take home and actually do. I'm going to show you the strategy and have a video to go with it. And uh, Remy has one slide, so if you take a, just about two minutes, Remy, and we'll spend the other uh, five minutes just... Okay. Yeah, in most cases, kids don't lie. And sometimes if you don't, you are not careful, if you don't, don't believe them or you don't give them an ear, they'll shut down. And once they shut, they, it will be difficult because they feel you haven't really, you know, you are not trusting them. They're, they're telling you this. And, and in our culture, they would sometimes actually, or these are some of the slides of the teachings that were happening in, in Zambia. So yeah, if you, if you are not careful, they'll just shut down. Now I have this last slide that um, kind of a concept framework of some sort. So in this slide, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to connect us and see how basically we are connected or wh what's happening is connected from family, to community. So in family, in most cases, there is a dilemma of when should I start talking about these issues. I think uh, Ruby has, has talked about that quite a lot. And what should I say? You know, as parents, we fail to really know or 
try to grasp how, how to even tell the children about these anatomy and sexual issues. And so I'm saying children are a gift from God and they need to, to be loved and nurtured. They are not an investment. And so in our cultures, sometimes children are just looked at as an investment. You, you find people having so many children just because what they're trying to have is someone who will help me in their old age. And so teaching about some of these things, how they may grow is, is kind of rare. And then we talk of the community. So in our culture, we say it takes a community to raise a child. So it is impossible to delineate from community. And so you can't separate yourself from community. The children that are in family, eventually they'll be part of the community that surrounds that family. And so the people that are around them, some of them will be the people that really, uh, you know, coerce them to do some of these things in a subtle way. And then we have a local church, you know, Christian teachings. Uh, which we expect from the local churches so that they actually adopt this uh, theory of uh, adoption that we have. Now, in this case, we are talking about even orphaned children, children that uh, do not even have someone to, you know, to, to someone to call dad. Uh, so they are the most vulnerable ones. And then finally, on that, on that upper part, we have the human security uh, issue part. This... Uh, child abuse is a human security issue. Sexual abuse um, affects the total being of a child. So from physical, emotional, psychological, all those issues begin to manifest in a child that is being abused. And I mean, you find suicides there. If a child, you are, you are refusing that the child is telling you a story about being abused and you are not being careful to give them an ear, you are basically uh, subjecting them to do all sorts of harm to themselves. And so underneath, there is what we call child protection initiatives at play. So some of these things are at play in, in, in how to handle this. There's the cultural issues. In what, what kind of the culture are you in? Like, you know, do, do, how do they... Um, do they relate to children. Then there are spiritual or religious issues that are also at play, okay? And then, of course, we know the, the legal issues. You, you should know the, the laws of the country. And also, the, the, just the difficult of sometimes the legal issues. Ruby was talking about, you know, if you use boo-boo, <laughs> how will you even win the case in the courts of law? So those are some of the things that we, 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 we need to be aware of at least to make sure that as we tackle these issues, in which kind of environment and context do we find ourselves? Thank you. Thank you very much, Remy. Thank you. Um, I do want to give you a strategy. We might run just a couple minutes over. Is that okay? I want to give you something you can practice with kids. And uh, I'm going to um, just let me um, pull it up here one minute. Okay, I want to, this is a strategy we started using 10 years ago and as a result of some of the work we're doing in helping kids to say no and to be strong. And what we do, in, uh, and Kenya uses this, it's almost used pretty much all across Kenya as well. But when we look at this, what we want to do is we want to help kids know that they have a right to take control of their body. We've had all the conversations with them, safe talk, safe touch, and here we are right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use really concrete examples with them. And number one, I'm going to empower them. I want to empower them. So I'm going to have them use their hand, and they're going to put their hand up, and I'm going to say, if anyone ever tries to touch you, come close to you, you have a right to find a safe person and tell them. So our hand is going to represent five different people. Every finger represents a different person. We started doing this 10 years ago, at least 10 years ago, it might have been 12, and we've seen incredible results as a result of this, where kids have been safe. Number one, if someone tries to touch you, and you have an uncomfortable touch, an unwanted touch, an unsafe touch, who would be a safe person you could go to? Who might the child say? 
Mommy. Okay, this is mommy. So if someone tries to touch you, give you an unsafe touch, and I want to touch you, you're going to run and tell mommy. If mommy doesn't believe you, who's the second person you can go to? Who can this finger be? Teacher. teacher. What is the teacher's name? I want a name for teacher. Miss Precious. Miss Precious. So mommy first. If mommy doesn't believe you, you're going to go to who? Miss Precious, the teacher. If Miss Precious doesn't believe you, who can you go to next? Grandma. Okay, if grandma doesn't believe you, who can you go to next? Who? School nurse. What's the school nurse's name? Miss Lucy. Miss Precious. Okay, mommy. Miss Precious, the teacher. Grandma. Miss Lucy, the school nurse. Okay, if the school nurse, Miss Lucy, doesn't believe you, who can you go to next? The police. What police officer? Do you know a policeman? Do you have a name? If you don't know a police officer? Okay, can we figure out somebody who we have a name? Who could you go to who has a name here? Okay, I'm only going to let the aunt stay because we have two non-relatives here. If these were all relatives, I would have to find somebody who's a non-relative. Okay, because who abuses children? People who are closest to them. So we have, we're going to use uh, auntie then. Aunt, which auntie? Auntie Angie. Okay, so we're going to go to mommy first of all. If mommy doesn't believe, who's next? Miss Precious. Miss Precious doesn't believe. Grandma. Grandma, Grandma doesn't believe. School nurse, Miss Lucy. And Miss Lucy doesn't believe. Auntie Angie. Okay. Now, well, so we're, and we're going to do that. And I'm going to go back to my child again and again, and I'm going to remind them that these are their safe people. Their hand represents safe people. And so from that, I also want to teach my child to say no. Can I have a volunteer? I need a volunteer. Come on down. I got a volunteer right here. Come on down. Okay, so you're my little 10-year-old girl, and we've had all the conversations, and all of this has been very clear. Let me just... Blank that out. There we go. And uh, so what, I've, what she's got, she's got the five people. And so what I want her to do right now, I want to teach her to say no. So if someone tries to touch you or approach you and you feel uncomfortable, I want you to be able to say no, and you're going to run to who? Mommy. Okay, we got it figured out. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to practice saying no. Um, is a bear a big bear? How big are bears? Can you show me what a bear looks like when they're mad? <laughs> okay, if a bear were going to say no, what might it sound like? A bear no. Give me a bear no. No! I like it. I like it. Well, here's what we're going to do. If somebody tries to approach you, I want you to think about being a bear. Okay. And I want you to say the loudest no you can say. Okay? okay. And then what are you going to do? You're going to run to? Mom. Mommy. Okay, well, let's, let's practice. Let's practice the no's, okay? So on the count of three, I want you to be a bear. And tell me no. Okay, one, two, three. No! Oh, that's really good. We're, I think the bear's meaner. Okay. Okay, I'm going to be a bear with you. We're going to practice the loudest, meanest no, because we want everybody to hear this no. Everybody. We, can, we want the police to come in here, okay? We're going to let me say no, no, so I, Okay, on the count of three, we're gonna, I'm going to practice with you. Somebody's coming in. They're going to touch you. One, two, three. No! That is perfect. Perfect. Good job. And then you're going to run and tell, Mom. and Mommy doesn't believe you? Then I'm going to go to my teacher, Miss, Miss Precious. Precious. And if Miss Precious doesn't believe you? My grand. Grammy. And if Grammy doesn't believe you? Auntie. 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 Lucy. Lucy. Okay, Lucy. And if, if Nurse Lucy doesn't believe you? Auntie Angie, and we're going to run and we're going to tell somebody, right? Okay, good job, good job, very good job. So anyway, I tell you, this is a strategy, and it really is a fun one for kids. They get to practice, and I know all kinds of stories. I can give you story after story after story of children that are safe as a result. Yes? You made a little point, which just, did you I want someone on this hand that's not a relative because often if a relative is going to protect another relative, I mean, we, we get that complexity that comes in. We also know that children are often abused by someone who's close to them and relatives are, are close to them, of course. So if they were all relatives, like say mom, dad, uh, grandma, grandpa, you know, auntie, they could easily be 
protecting one another. Yeah. So we want someone that's, that's clear on there. And I would prefer to have more than one, but I definitely don't want all relatives on the hand. So you'll coach a child a little bit. Let's do what? Let's talk it at home, keep it at home, exactly. And we don't want that. We want kids to be empowered. I had a situation, in, and this is where we're going to end. I'm, I'm one minute over right now. But I'll, I'm going to end with this one. I did this training in Botswana here uh, a number of years ago. Uh, no, sorry, Zimbabwe. We did, I've done it all over, but we did it in Zimbabwe. We had a 20, 20, 125 people in the training. It was training on trauma. And this is part of our trauma training in one of the modules. And did this training. Everybody practiced in the room, 125 of them saying no all over the place. It was very good practice. And the mother of two little kids, a little girl and a little boy, went home that night and she's a caregiver in an orphanage. She decided she's going to take that information and teach the kids in the orphanage where she works. Great idea. Great idea. So she went home that night and she said, okay, I think I'm going to start to practice right away, but I should practice with my kids. I should really just see how it works. So she brought her children in. She went through the five fingers, the safe people, how to say no. They practice. They, she was really pleased that she could do it. And then a little later in the evening, she hears her son say to her little daughter, you can tell mommy she's one of our safe people the very language she had just used. And she said she just went cold. She called the children in and she said, I just heard what you said, that mommy's a safe person. Is there something that you want to tell me? And they said yes. And they proceeded to tell her that their babysitter, their caregiver that was there every day, had been putting the children into sexual poses and photographing them with their cell, her, their cell phone. The investigation that followed after that found all kinds of horrible pictures of these children, and who knows where it would have gone had these children not been given an opportunity to speak their voice and use their voice. And when we look at this, I tell you, we cannot underestimate the power of teaching a child to say no and take ownership of their body. Go home and practice. Don't be silent. Don't be embarrassed. Teach your caregivers, your staff, your colleagues what we've just looked at, this tiny little strategy. Figure out how you can become and connected with, with touch talk as well. Don't let another day go forward where a child becomes vulnerable to be unsafe. I just encourage you. Last thought, Remy, and then we're going to close. Okay. Um, one other thing, one other strategy, especially with... Um uh, teenagers, like maybe those that are, you know, still children, uh, is, is to give them some kind of secret codes, especially where you give them phones. If they find themselves in a very compromising situation where they are not comfortable, they can call you to come and pick them up or, you know, something like that by just saying words that you agreed without necessarily saying, oh, well, I'm... I'm you know, I can't feel comfortable here, this, this person or something. But they can just say the words that you teach. You teach them that, you know, they feel like they are not, they are not in a very good conducive place. And, and they can be rescued from there. All right, group, we are done. Thank you very much. We had what, what, one comment, one question. Yes, please, I don't want to miss it. Yes, sir. Poverty. Poverty has exposed many children to yeah. sexual abuse. Yes, like absolutely. absolutely. In the case in court now, where a German came in in an umbrella for helping children, uh -huh. yeah. and he sexual abused 17 of them. Oh is now in jail. But when kids were asked, why could you not report such cases? Everybody said, we feared to be thrown out. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. So, I get it. I get it. Go ahead. No, we've got a similar, we've got um, a, a teacher um, that is also a chair of a local community school. And his, he's responsible for dishing out the money to other community schools. Now, he's, he's 
he sexually abused that we know of, three girls, age 12, one of them's pregnant. Now, interestingly, a lot of the churches that we work with were involved in bailing him out. Yeah, these are people that have received our training, yeah, been involved in the work we do, talk about child safeguarding, know about child protection, yet because they rely on this person to give them the money to pay for their own 200 children in the community schools, they felt that they needed to let, they needed to, yeah, that, and it's crazy because it's like, what? How did that happen? That this, how is it being allowed in that community? A high density area, lots of children that rely, and, and, and small, sort of small NGOs rely on this money. And poverty, it's just like that mindset. And it's like, it's crazy, like, yeah. So I totally feel, but I think the issue with that German guy, I think that could have been, that's around, like what you said, screening, checks, just because someone's got money, just because they're a donor, don't, you know, never feel they should be allowed access to the children in your facilities or tourism, like orphanage tourism, all this stuff doesn't, yeah, it's crazy. But I'm glad that he's been, I'm glad they spoke out eventually and it was discovered. Amen. Listen, we're done. I'm, your break is out there. Please go and have a great break. You've got one more choice session for the rest of the day. We've got a general session, and you've been a great audience. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>